I now invite Professor John Dugard to take the floor. You have the floor, Professor. Madam President, distinguished members of the court, it is a great privilege to appear before you today on behalf of the Republic of South Africa. In my speech, I will address the question of jurisdiction. The people of South Africa and of Israel both have a history of suffering. Both states have become parties to the Genocide Convention in the determination to end suffering. In this spirit, neither has attached a reservation to Article 9 of the Convention on the Prevention and Punishment of the Crime of Genocide. It is in terms of this Convention dedicated to saving humanity that South Africa brings this dispute before the Court. <coughs> the prohibition on Genocide is a peremptory norm. Obligations under the Genocide Convention are ergo omnes, obligations owed to the international community as a whole. States parties to this convention are obliged not only to desist from genocidal acts, but also to prevent them. That the obligation of state parties to prevent acts of genocide is the foundation of the convention is clear from its placement in Article 1 of the Convention. <coughs> Article 9 of the Genocide Convention makes it clear that state parties are guardians of the Genocide Convention. Unlike other treaties designed to protect human rights, it does not oblige states to pursue negotiations as a prelude to approaching this court. It does not treat the ending of genocidal acts as a bilateral affair between states. Instead, it envisages a situation in which a state, acting on behalf of the international community as a whole, seizes the jurisdiction of the court as a matter of urgency to prevent genocide. South Africa has a long history of close relations with Israel. For this reason, it did not bring the dispute immediately to the attention of the court. It watched with horror as Israel responded to the terrible atrocities committed against its people on 7 of October, with an attack on Gaza that resulted in the indiscriminate killing of innocent Palestinian civilians, most of whom were women and children. The South African government repeatedly voiced its concerns in the Security Council and in public statements that Israel's actions had become genocidal. On 10 November, in a formal diplomatic day march, it informed Israel that while it condemned the actions of Hamas, it wanted the International Criminal Court to investigate the leadership of Israel for international crimes, including genocide. As the court will know, the definition of genocide in the Rome Statute repeats that of the Genocide Convention. On 17 October, South Africa referred Israel's commission of the crime of genocide to the International Criminal Court for, quote, vigorous investigation, unquote. In announcing this decision, President Ramaphosa publicly expressed his abhorrence for what is happening right now in Gaza, which is now turned into a concentration camp where genocide is taking place. To accuse a state of committing acts of genocide and to condemn it in such strong language is a major act on the part of a state. At this stage, it became clear that there was a serious dispute between South Africa and Israel, which would end only with the end of Israel's genocidal acts. 
South Africa repeated this accusation at a meeting of BRICS on 21 November and at an emergency special session of the United Nations General Assembly on 12 December. No response from Israel was forthcoming. None was necessary. By this time, the dispute had crystallized as a matter of law. This was confirmed by Israel's official and unequivocal denial on 6 December that it was committing genocide in Gaza. However, as a matter of courtesy, before filing the present application, on 21 December, South Africa sent a note verbal to the Embassy of Israel to reiterate its view that Israel's acts of genocide in Gaza amounted to genocide, that it as a state party to the Genocide Convention was under an obligation to prevent genocide from being committed. Israel responded by way of a note for Mal that failed to address the issues raised by South Africa in its note and neither affirmed nor denied the existence of a dispute. <coughs> this was emailed later on the 27th of December. This note was received by the relevant South African team on the 29th of December after the present application was filed. On 4 January, South Africa replied to this note verbal, highlighting Israel's failure to prevent any response to the matters raised by South Africa over the previous months, as reiterated in its note verbal. South Africa made it clear that given Israel's ongoing conduct against Palestinians in Gaza, the dispute re referred to in its note verbal of 21 December remained unresolved and was plainly not capable of resolution by way of a bilateral meeting. Nevertheless, South Africa proposed a meeting on 5 January again out of courtesy. Israel responded to this note verbal by proposing that we reconnect to coordinate a meeting at the earliest opportunity after the close of hearings in the present case. To this, South Africa understandably replied that such a meeting would serve no purpose. Madam President, these notes verbal are all to be found in the judge's folder. The existence of a dispute is a matter to be determined by an objective determination of the facts as they existed at the time of the filing of the application. At this time, South Africa had already accused Israel in the Security Council, the General Assembly and other public fora of engaging in genocidal acts. It had conducted a diplomatic day march on Israel, warning it that it viewed its conduct as genocidal. It had requested the International Criminal Court to vigorously investigate crimes under the Genocide Convention committed by Israel in the Gaza Strip, and it accused Israel inter alia of the deliberate targeting of civilians, intentionally causing starvation and impeding relief supplies. It had accused Israel leaders of expressing, quote, the intent of committing genocide. Israel had flatly denied South Africa's accusations. <coughs> Despite these harsh accusations, Israel has persisted in its genocidal acts against the population of Gaza. What more evidence could be required to establish a dispute? It is precisely because of a situation of this kind affecting the international community as a whole that Article 9 of the Genocide Convention does not require negotiations as a precondition to seizing the jurisdiction of the court. Certainly, a respondent state 
cannot prevent a referral to the court by claiming that there is no dispute and that it wants discussions on this matter when the existence of the dispute is clear. For a state to insist on a time frame for negotiations would simply be a license to commit genocide and would run counter to the object and purpose of the, Geneva, of the Genocide Convention. Madam President, the question of the crystallization of a dispute has been addressed by this court in preliminary objections at the merit stage where the burden of proof is higher. Although the court has generally adopted a flexible approach to the subject, it has laid down a number of tests for the existence of a dispute. First, it must be shown that the claim of one party is positively opposed by the other. Second, the date for determining the existence of the dispute is the date of the application, but subsequent conduct may be considered. Three, whether the dispute exists must be determined by an objective determination of the facts. And four, a dispute exists when it is demonstrated on the basis of the evidence that the respondent was aware or could not have been unaware that its views were positively opposed. When these propositions are applied to the facts of this case, it is incontrovertible that a dispute exists between South Africa and Israel. South Africa strongly believes that what Israel is doing in Gaza amounts to genocide. Israel denies this and claims that such an accusation is legally and factually wrong and, moreover, is obscene. So an objective determination of the facts shows that a dispute existed on the date of the submission of South Africa's application, and this has been confirmed by Israel's subsequent statements and by its continuing conduct in Gaza. Moreover, Israel must have been aware from South Africa's public statements, the demarche, and the referral of the matter to the International Criminal Court of Israel's genocidal acts that a dispute existed between the two states. Madam President, the Court has indicated that in an application for provisional measures, it is sufficient to show that there is a prima facie basis for jurisdiction. It is submitted that South Africa has convincingly established the existence of a dispute between it and Israel over the fulfilment of the latter's obligations under the Genocide Convention. Finally, it is submitted that regard should be had to the special considerations that apply to the existence of a dispute under Article 9 of the Genocide Convention between a state that brings an application in furtherance of its obligation to prevent genocide and a state accused of committing genocide. This concludes my speech. Madam President, I thank you, the members of the court, for your attention. I now ask you to call to the podium Professor Max to proceed to address you on the nature of the rights requiring protection and the link between such rights and the measures requested. Thank you.